If you love God, say amen. amen. If you love God, say amen again. Amen. God is good how often? All and all the time. If I look at somebody, I know with social distance here, but just look across at somebody and say, neighbor, neighbor. God, loves God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break. I love him too. Well, Brother I Campbell, I woke up early this morning. My heart was beating right on time. I said, Lord, I truly thank you for opening up these eyes of mine. And this and then I went over to the window while I was peeping out the shade. Once again, I had to tell him, thank you, Lord, for letting me see another day. Now the sun was brightly shining and the wind was blowing not too strong. And in a treetop just a few feet away, Brother Robin was singing a song. Now, I don't know what he was singing, and pretty soon he was on his way. But who's to say he wasn't being grateful, saying, Lord, thank you for another day. Now, I know we got a lot going on right now in our country and in our respective areas. But I know some right now, all of us got one or two reasons that we can tell God thank you on this morning. Because surely God has been better to you than you've ever thought about even being to your very own self. God is providing for you. God is protecting you, protecting you from danger seen and unseen. Still got food and refrigerator. Your light still coming on. Water still coming coming out the faucet. I know you might not think you got anything to be thankful for right now. Well, I'm out of job. I'm out of work. I can't go to my job. But guess what? God is still providing a way for it to. I think David said it like this. I never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. God will always provide a way for his children. That's something we can believe right there. And I believe I got two or three people in here with me this morning that have ever trusted in God. You've ever depended on God been down between a rock and a hard place at your wit's end? Am I going to go right? Am I going to go left? But God provides a way of escape for his children. So I want to encourage you all that are watching this this morning, hold on just a little while longer because everything is certainly going to be all right. You might have to wrestle with this angel all night, but guess what? Wrestle until the Lord give you your blessing. Amen. We're, we're trusting in God on this morning. And we just want to thank all of you that are tuning in with us this morning. We love you, all of our Sweetwater family that are tuning in. We just want to let you know that we love you all, and we pray that you are doing well, you and your family wherever you are this morning and for all of those that are watching us across the country hey mama grandma all y'all watching this morning we just want to thank you all for tuning in and we pray that you will be blessed as a result of the things that are said here um on this morning god is good and even in the midst of a pandemic he's worthy to be praised Somebody said from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The name of the Lord is worthy to be prayed. And I think a lot of us would learn how to get further along in life if we learn how to praise God during the bad times. If we learn how to praise God when things are not going the way that we think they ought to go. But, but Lord, even though I don't understand, I trust you. Even though I can't see it, even though I can't trace you, Lord, I trust you and I'm going to depend on you. I'm going to depend on you. Is there a word from the Lord? There is a word from the Lord. I pray that you all this morning, for those of you watching, I pray that you will turn with me this morning to the gospel according to John. The gospel according to John chapter number two. And we're going to commence reading at verse number one. And we're going to conclude at verse number four. The grass withers and the flower thereof shall fade away. But the word of God shall stand forever. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And on the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was bidden and his disciples to marriage. And when the wine ran out, what kind of part is that? They ain't had no wine. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have ran out of wine. And Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Amen. Pray with me, if you will. Spirit of the living God, we thank you on this morning. 
Father, we thank you because you're awesome. We thank you because you're all powerful. We thank you, Father, because you are high and lifted up. And we lift you up morning because you've given us your word that we are to guide ourselves back. Now, Father, I ask that you would anoint these lips of clay. Hide me behind your cross that no flesh will take any glory in what you ought to have. And, Father, if you grant us these petitions and prayers, we'd be so ever mindful to give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor of which you are so worthy of. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to give for a subject on this morning, I will not lose focus. Amen. I will not lose focus. Those of you at home, say it with me. I will not lose focus. God allows distractions that he does not tolerate, that he tolerates in the beginning, that he does not tolerate in the end. He goes to the marriage at Cana, and he goes there to attend a function. And his mother comes up to him and says, Lord, we're running out of wine. And he says, woman, what does that have to do with me? Now, Mary couldn't have been a sister because you, talk, you know you like that. You talk to your mama like that. You're picking up your teeth off the ground. But he said, woman, what has that to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Uh, I'm not supposed to be doing this. This is not on my schedule. This is not on my itinerary. But bring me the water and I'll do it. I I I'll just do it. And so the marriage at Cana, though it has a significant biblical standing, and we'll talk about that on a different day, was really a distraction because his hour had not yet come. This text starts out by saying that Jesus' hour had not yet come. Do you know when your hour has come? The point and the stage where things become valuable to you and become important enough to you that you can't afford to be distracted. You say, well, God has been too good to me. God has brought me through this stage of my life, and I dare not let God bring me through this stage of my life to bring me to this stage of my life, and I'll be struggling and distracted by stuff that God has already brought me over. I cannot afford to be distracted. He said, my hour has not yet come. In fact, I want to say it just like this, and he, he steadfastly set his face. The time made him set his face to go toward Jerusalem. Don't, don't, don't look over there. The time made him set his face toward Jerusalem. Because of what the time was, he had to set his face. And I, I'd have you to know, beloved, that there are some things that you cannot receive in life without focusing yourself. But the greater the thing you would have God to do in your life, let me tell you, it's not going to be done casually. It's not going to be done superficially. You're not going to be able to just serve God part time or with a spirit of indifference in order to really step into the fullness of what you want God to do. You're going to have to set your face and you are going to have to get yourself focused. Somebody said like this, you got to get your head in the game. I'm, I'm, I always meet people that, that, that never set their face on anything in life. They never get focused on anything. Y'all ever met people like that? They, they just, maybe they glanced at it a time or two in their life. Maybe, maybe they, they looked at it. They, they took pictures with it. They got a couple of selfies with it. But they never really stepped into their purpose, never really tried to focus themselves to do any real work for God. They got a little glimpse at it. They got a little kit of it. But they never, they never really stuck into it and say, hey, I'm going to focus. I have a mission. I have a job to do and I dare not let anything that the devil sets up stop me from doing the will of God. They've never really experienced it. You, you are, and, and what do you know when that you are when you set your face, you are, you can do powerful things when you, when you focus yourself. I wonder for you that are watching this this morning, what would happen if you would really get yourself in focus? How would your life change if you really got yourself in focus? How would your marriage change if you really got yourself into 
focus? How would your relationship with your children change if you really got yourself in focus? How would your relationship with God and your level of spirituality change if you really got yourself in focus? Nothing in this life will ever be successful to you until you get your head in the game. I can't be part of the way in. I can't have half of myself in the world, half of myself in God. You got to be fully and totally dedicated to the cause of Christ and you got to have your mind in the game. My hand can want to go out that side door all it won't. But until my mind gets in line with my hand and my brain say, hey, go, my body ain't going nowhere. I got to get my mind in line with what's going on. So the Bible said Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. And, and there's no ambiguity about it. There's no confusion about it. He's no more saying, I'm going to go hang out by the well and wait on a woman to come down here so we can have a conversation. No, no more of that. No more of that. No more of him disappearing into the crowd and having to catch up with them by walking on the water to meet them on the boat. No more of that. No more disappearing. No more going behind the rocks to pray. No more. He has set his face toward Jerusalem. Until you set your face to go to where God wants you to be, going to church will always be hard for you. Getting up on Sunday morning will always be hard for you until you get your mind in line with God. It, it's inconvenient for me. You, you know, I don't feel like it. I got this to do. I got that. I got to go here. I got to go there. Until you set your face. If somebody takes your parking spot, you'll be ready to go back home. If you're not able to get your favorite seat in the church, you'll be ready to go back home. Somebody used to date 10 years ago, walk up in the church, and now you don't feel comfortable in the service because you don't want to be in that with them. Until you get your mind in line with God and realize the purpose for which God has sent you into this world, you will use any and everything that you can find as an excuse not to stay focused and do the will of God. So, but when you set your face toward Jerusalem, he sent a team ahead of him to go scout out a new area, and he's moving toward Jerusalem. And they went down to Samaria. And, and went out to Samaria, the Samaritans would not make room for Jesus. And that didn't really make sense to me, y'all, when I was looking at this lesson because it, it's a mess because Jesus spent time at the well. And, and he made an investment in Samaria and caused them to be converted down there in Samaria. And they're supposed to be growing. They're supposed to be a thriving group of believers in Samaria. But at the moment that he needed Samaria, they had no room. Isn't it funny how people got all kind of room when they need you? That's a sermon for a whole nother day right there. Isn't it funny how folk got room when they knew, or oh, I'm going to mess with somebody here this morning. You are might as well at home. Just go ahead and fasten your seatbelt. They had all kind of room when they were on the receiving end, but when it's your time to receive something, they say, oh, wait, well, no, 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 we, we don't have any room. So they said, send him somewhere else. And James and John, of all people, I, I, I was shook at James and John because this really sounded more like something that Peter would do. You know, I'm kidding to Peter Peterson. You know, I'm related to Peter. But, you know, I, I really thought that this was something that Peter would do because they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn them up like Elisha did? Let's kill all of Wait a minute. They just don't let us spend the night. They don't want us to spend the night. We don't want to have to do, we don't want to have to kill everybody just because they don't give us the response that we're looking for. Why is it that people want to kill you just because you don't respond the way they want you to respond? Why is that people get an attitude when they don't go with the crew, when you don't go along with the crowd or go along with that plan, it seems like people always want a yes man on their side or a yes woman on their side. They want somebody on their side that if you're about to jump off a cliff, they're going to say, okay, take another step, go on off the cliff. They always want somebody to come along and co-side along with their plan. But I'm so glad that I serve a God that is not really concerned about our plans. He's not concerned about our motive. The scripture says that our thoughts are not his thoughts. 
Our ways are not his ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so far are his ways from our way. The writer even said like this, that the steps of a good man are ordered by God. I consider myself to be an all right man this morning. So I know that my steps have been ordered by the Lord. But people always seem to find the issue when you don't respond the way that they want you to respond. And, and, and now, see, 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 people don't want to hear this because it, it don't seem like to me that this required that kind of reaction. You, you, you can't stay with me this morning. It's different because it, you can't stay with me tonight. It's different from dropping a bomb and killing all the folk in the city. Let's call down fire from heaven and kill everybody. And that's when my heart got heavy. I, I wasn't so heavy because the Samaritans didn't receive him. My God got heavy that the men who were with him, James and John, who were close to him, they were in the right place, but they had the wrong spirit. Do you know that you can be in the right place and have the wrong attitude? Do you know that you can be in the right place and have the wrong spirit? You can be in the right place and worry why everything ain't going right and blaming everybody else because they're the problem when you don't realize that the problem is the one talking about the problem. Oh, good God Almighty. And that's, and, and that's why I got him because James and John, who, who, who've been walking with Jesus, who've been sleeping with Jesus, who've been eating with Jesus, they have every opportunity possible to figure out what is the will of God for their life. But they got the wrong spirit. Samaria has no room. They had no room for Jesus. They don't understand that Jesus is used to people not having room. Am I right about it? He used to people not having room. He was born in a manger. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He started his life in a barn because people didn't have no room. And isn't it funny how life comes around full circle and everything old becomes new again at some point in your life? If you live long enough in this life, you'll learn that Satan cannot create. He can only imitate. I said, Satan cannot create. He can only imitate. So he's got to bring the same stuff up back over and over again. And, and Jesus is saying, hey, this didn't stop my mama and it's not going to stop me. It didn't stop my daddy and it's not going to stop me. It didn't stop my uncle. So it's not going to stop me. It is not going to stop me. And I'm not going to be bothered just because you don't have any room. Whenever somebody shuts a door, I believe is always a sign. God will not allow anything to close in your life unless he got something else prepared for you. I fully believe that. I fully believe that. Y'all don't want to hear what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, about, I'm, I'm preaching in here this morning because I, I believe I got a full crowd in here this morning. And, the, and I want to tell somebody that there is another village. I don't know who that's for, but there is another village just because they don't open up for you in Samaria. There is another village. God has a place that he is preparing for you. And if they said no, they are not it. They are not the one. There is another village. Somebody say, I got a family village. I got a family village. Notice they didn't give the name of the village. They, they don't give the name of the other village. You got to seek it because what's a village for me might not be a village for you. So I can't tell you exactly what it is, but there's another village somewhere behind beyond Samaria. Somewhere beyond your anger about Samaria is another village. If you call fire down from heaven on Samaria, it's a sign that you don't believe that there's another village. If you want to call down fire from heaven and destroy everything, that is only indicative of the fact that you don't believe that God got something better prepared. And I want to encourage somebody on here this morning that when something fails and you feel like, hey, this is it, I cannot go any further, I cannot do anything else, I would have you to know that when man puts up a, a period, God can insert a comma and say that this is not it, there is more to come out. After this, you better learn how to trust in God. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. 
It's a sign that you don't believe God got another village. Your anger, listen, your anger is a manifestation of unbelief that you don't believe something better is coming. And the reason you're upset about your old boyfriend is because you don't believe God can give you a new one. And so you got to you. So you're walking around mad and you're angry and you want to call down fire from heaven simply because things aren't working for you how you expected them to work. Anytime people want to call down fire, they've lost hope. But as long as you got hope, you don't have time to spend your energy calling down fire. But because your life is not over yet. There is another village. There is another village. So here comes a guy that says, I want to follow you whithersoever thou goest. I'm with you, Jesus. I'm down for you. I'm going all the way with you. And Jesus turns and looks at him and says, foxes have holes. And the birds of the air have nests. But the son of man have nowhere to lay his head. In other words, following me ain't easy. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to what? Pick up your cross. Can you drink from the cup that I drink from? I, I have a baptism to be baptized with. Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Foxes have holes. In other words, watch this. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. Jesus is now teaching us that we were never meant to fit into this world. Come on now. And the phrase that the Lord gives us when, when, when we're looking at this and when I was studying is that I found the term of casual Christians. You know, casual Christians want a little bit of Jesus in their life, but don't change my life. Just ride with me in case we run into some trouble. No, no, Jesus, you can't have my life. I'll just come visit you on Sunday morning if that's all right. I, I'm not willing to really commit to this thing, but I'll date you. I'll hang around with you, Jesus. I can give you a little praise sometime, but really, really becoming that kind of Christian that you want. I'm not really down for that. I would rather you be the opiate of my affection. I would, I would rather you be the center of my joy. I really hadn't co considered all of that. I had just decided that I would come to church. And so, so you keep trying to find where you fit in the world. And Jesus said, I made holes for foxes. I made nests for birds. But the home for you is not of this world. But the Jesus who ran away, the man who asked to follow them, then turns around and asks another guy to follow him. He asked him to follow himself. You just ran the other guy off. I knew he wasn't about nothing. I ran him off. He saw me in a ministry. And, you know, one thing that you will lose as you learn, if you, as, as long as you're growing as a Christian, and if you ever reach a certain level in your life, you're going to lose something called personhood. Because when people no longer see you as a person, but they see you as an opportunity, they no longer treat you as a person. Because they're only looking at you for what they can get out of you. And the minute that they cannot get anything out of you, they have no more use for you. You just like a, a, a drink that I've got all the drink out of. I got all my ice out of the cup. Now I ain't got no use for the cup. I'm just throwing it away. And when people look at you as an opportunity, anything you say, they'll do. In the place that you want to go, they'll go because they're seeking to gain something from you. I need people around me that can give a little bit of something. I mean, you can, you can give me some knowledge. You can give me something. You can build me up as well as I can build you up. And I'm not be a one-way street. But we ought to all be contributing to one another. Be contributing to one another. So that, that's what you call a, a, a casual Christianity. When, when people do things for God simply out of what I can get from God. Amen. What can God do for me? You understand that, don't you? Now, now, now Jesus turns to another man. And says, follow me. And says, I got buried my father. Now, I think that would have been a good excuse. 
I think that would have been the best excuse that anybody could have had. Man, I got to go bury my daddy. My daddy just died. And that seems to be a good excuse, or really good one, you know, but, but Jesus didn't have time for excuses. His hour had come. He needed somebody that would respond without excuses. And listen, now we know Jesus is not cold because he cried at the tomb of Lazarus. He stopped the widow in name and laid hands on her casket and raised her son from the dead. This is the same Jesus, the same Jesus that went into Jairus' daughter and raised her from the dead. This is the same Jesus that looks at him because it's late now. Let the dead bury the dead. See how his attitude has changed? He used to would have gone and woke his father up, but it's late now. Somebody is late now, and we can't expect him to do what he used to do because now he has set his face. Don't expect me to go through what I used to go through because now I've set my face. Let the dead bury the dead. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to make me a priority. You can't be a casual Christian. Everybody I ever know who has ever excelled at anything, whoever broke loose and did real well in life, they always give you trophies and they put you in the Hall of Fame, but your strength is not in what you're running to. The strength is fine in what you have come from. Because where I am right now is only a picture of the goodness of God that I've already experienced in my life. And all of us in here right now, all of all of y'all got some BC stories in here that you can tell this morning. Before I came to Jesus, before I met Christ, before he came into my life, I was X, Y, and Z. But now that I met Jesus, my entire life has changed. I'm better because I met the man from Galilee. When you have been through certain things in your yesterday, you can't afford to slack up like other people slack up. Because when you got to get up to a point in your life and you recognize that it is only God that allowed you to get there, you got to take full advantage of it. It's not just your ambition and your drive and your goals. It's knowing that you can't afford to look back. What you looking back for? What it say on the mirror in your car? It said objects in the mirror are just a little bit closer than they appear. So, so even if the devil is gaining on me, I don't want to look and see that it's gaining on me. I want to keep my eyes focused on the prize, keep my eyes on the goal of heaven. And I realize that the devil is going to set up traps. He's going to set up snares along this path to try and take me down. But having done all to stand. Stand. Therefore, and I came to tell you this morning for those of you watching that have come from some bad situations in your life, that it was all just a setup for what God was going to do in your life. Nothing happens in life by accident. I would have you to know that it is all a part of the divine will of God. And if your life would have been better, you would have been lazy. If you would have been given everything on a silver spoon, never had to work for anything, you would have ended up lazy. Paul who was the chief center, became the head apostle. Whenever you're going to build a building real high, you got to dig a real deep foundation. Whenever you're going to build something high, you got to build a real good foundation. It was good for me, he said, that I was afflicted. Now, here's the point. This is why Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the gospel plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom, is in good shape for the kingdom of God. When you put your hand to the plow, the reason you got to keep forward, keep moving forward, keep going forward is because you have nothing behind you but problems. Nothing behind you but trauma, hands bowed, iron clothes, going through the motions. If God, if you've prayed to God long enough and God has been gracious enough to deliver you from that, why are you looking back? Why are you looking back? Do you not trust God to take care of what you cannot take care of? Or are you just really concerned about it and do you, you miss that desire? You miss that delight that you got out of the troubles of your past. That was a little boy in, in clothes and a little boy that every night, he would get ready to go to bed. In the middle of the night, his mama would hear a thump. 
And, and she go in the little boy's room only to see that the little boy had fallen out of the bed. And, and the next night, and around the same time, the mama heard a thump. And she went in there and the little boy had fallen again out of the bed. And the next night, another thump. He fell out of the bed. He said, Mama, I'm sick of it, Mom. I'm tired. I'm tired of falling out of the bed. What is wrong with me? Why do I keep falling out of the bed? The mama said, Baby, the reason you're falling out of the bed is because you never got all the way in. The reason you're falling out of the bed is because you never got all the way in. That's, that's our statement this year, that we are all in for Christ. But can I tell you, until you get all the way in, life will never be better. Circumstances will never be made better. Situations will never work out right until you get yourself all the way in. Why is it, mama, that I keep falling out of the bed? I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. Why do I keep falling out of the bed? You got to get all the way in. Until you get your mind set toward Jerusalem. Jesus said, my, my, my time has now come. And after that moment, Jesus' whole mindset changed. His whole mission changed because now he realized, I'm on my way toward Jerusalem. Can you get your mind focused today? I know we're going through some troublesome times right now, and I believe that a word like this is good for us at a time like this because, truth be told, a lot of people right now, their faith is going like this. It's wavering. Their belief is going like this. It's wavering. They're, they're, they're like the father in the scripture that had a son that was having convulsion, and he was foaming at the mouth, and he's throwing himself into the water, and he's, he's doing this and that. And, and his father brought him to the disciples, expecting the disciples to be able to do something about his son's condition. And the disciples failed to do what it was that they could do because they themselves were struggling with their faith. How is it that you are supposed to be helping other people with their faith when at the same time you're struggling with your own faith? And so the father comes to Jesus and he's saying, hey, the problem is not with what I believe. The problem is that I need help with my unbelief. Because even though I believe certain situations in life can cause my belief to be mingled with doubt and uncertainty because things aren't going the way that I thought they ought to have gone. But beloved, until you get all the way in, mentally, because you can be in a place physically and mentally not be there. You know what it's like, man? And all of us have been at there at some point. Your, your, your physical body is in the church, but your mind, man, I wonder if I put them oxtails on low enough. I don't want them to burn up before I get to the house. I, I, I left my greens on the stove. I left them on low. I, I don't want them to scald. I don't want them to burn. Your, 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 your body is here, but your mind is out there somewhere else. You got to get your head in the game. Amen. You got to get focused. And when the church gets focused, the church can do great things. The church can do amazing things, not only in a church sense, a collective sense, but when you yourself get your mind in line with God. When you get rid of all distractions, Amen. when you get rid of all those habits and those hangups that you have in your personal life and say, hey, I cannot afford to be set back. I cannot afford to be distracted. God was good enough to bring me out of that last trouble that I got myself into. And since God was good enough to deliver me out of that last dilemma that I had, and I sat up enough nights crying, snot running down my nose, asking God to deliver me, asking God to bless me, and now that he has finally done it, I'm going to put my faith in him. I'm going to put my trust in him. I'm going to set my eyes on God because I have a mission and I have a goal. Get focused on this morning. Get your head in the game. Don't allow the tricks, the snares of the enemy to cause you to lose focus. But you got to keep your eyes on the prize. And that prize is the hope of heaven. Beloved, if you're watching this, on, this morning and you are not a Christian, you find yourself outside of the ark of safety, 
You have not yet had your sins washed away by the blood of the Son of God. I would have you to know that he's knocking at the door of your heart, and he wills that you would open the door and allow him to come in and sup with you, allow him to come in and make his abode with you. Salvation, as we've been talking about here, is a, a simple step. Salvation is a free gift that has been offered unto us. It has been offered unto all men. And he says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should be able to come to repentance. You come by hearing this word, believing the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism, have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to come up before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. And you will be buried with him in baptism. The scripture says that in any man being Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You can have a new start. You can have a new beginning in Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you're here in our area, reach out, call us. We'll be glad to meet with you here. If you are in a different area and you want to get in contact with somebody that can help you on today, we pray that you will reach out, message us, contact us. We want to help you in your walk with the Lord. For those of you that are standing in the need of prayer, we will that you would come in and let us know your prayer request. If you don't want to make those prayer requests public, we pray that you would inbox us, message us, and let us know the prayers and the concerns that you have on your heart. We will that you would give us the opportunity to pray with you because the scripture says that the prayers of the righteous, they do avail as much. We thank you for tuning in. And now may the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide henceforth now and forevermore that all God's children say, Amen. Hello, I'm Richard Coffey, Senior Minister of Sweetwater Church of Christ. I'm here with Minister uh, Peterson. I want to introduce him who's doing the pulpit preaching here for us. Hi, Brother Javante Peterson again, minister here at Sweetwater Church of Christ. we just like to take this opportunity to thank you for visiting us. We pray that you were blessed by the worship services. And if by chance you have any questions, we pray that you reach out and contact us so that we can answer any biblical questions that you have. For any Bible question that you can bring, we'll be sure to give you a Bible answer. Remember, morning Bible class starts on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Worship service begins at 10. Afternoon service begins at 6 o'clock. And then midweek Bible study begins at 7. We pray that you come out at any given moment. Come out, worship with us here at the Sweetwater Church of Christ, where the gospel is preached and the water is sweet. God bless you. God bless you. In this so sinful world, my time is running out, and the devil won't quit. He's trying to blind my eyes to the light of my life. But something is sustaining me. And I know it won't be long Till he comes and takes me home I gotta get ready for that day I don't wanna get left outside the gate It's my prayer, it's my plea with you It's where I wanna be